The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Shaping Modern Management of Myelofibrosis, Guidance on the Conjunction of Targeted Therapy and HCT. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash SDA 860. Downloadable slides are also available. Hi, I'm John Mascarenas, and welcome to Shaping Modern Management of Myelofibrosis. I'm from the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York, and I'm really pleased to welcome my colleague and friend, Dr. Aaron Gers from Cleveland Clinic, who's going to join me for this panel discussion today. So today we're really focusing on um, the intersection of modern JAK inhibitor therapy with allogeneic transplantation for patients with myelofibrosis. And throughout this discussion, we're going to use two cases to illustrate both the, the transplant eligible patient and the, the transplant ineligible patient where uh, transplant may not make sense and we really need to optimize our JAK inhibitor therapy and other options. So here we're showing you a slide um, demonstrating in 2023 the target therapeutic approach um, and role for transplant um, as the cornerstones of MF management. So it's, it's important to realize that there are now three approved JAK inhibitors uh, on the commercial market in the US, ruxolinib in 2011, fedratinib since 2019, and since 2022, picritinib specifically for MF patients with platelet counts less than 50,000. And of course, there are still JAK inhibitors in clinical development. The most uh, furthest along is mamalotinib, which we'll discuss today, uh, which has completed phase three testing in the second line for patients with symptomatic um, disease and anemia. Um, and really what this provides is an opportunity for, for JAK2 inhibitor selection to uh, develop um, approaches and sequencing of therapy to fill uh, unmet needs and niches. Regardless of JAK inhibitor therapy, whether one uses it up front or reserves it uh, for uh, lateral lines of therapy, hematopoietic transplantation remains the only modality that offers the potential to cure patients with myelofibrosis. Um, and these are not mutually exclusive uh, approaches. So often we use JAK inhibitors um, in, in route to or uh, a prelude to transplant for many patients. And we'll discuss the way to optimize that management and integrate transplant and JAK inhibition in the treatment of myelofibrosis in today's program. So despite the fact that we've, we've clearly had success and progress in the last decade in uh, advancing the understanding and translating that into therapeutic success for patients with myelofibrosis, there's still an unmet need that persists in this modern management uh, treatment era. Um, and this is one example of real world experience um, looking back um, through healthcare resource utilization records of patients in the United States with myelofibrosis. And really what this um, study shows us is that despite the fact that JAK inhibitors are used like roxalitinib, they're often underutilized and when utilized are often um, underdosed uh, in patients in where you're not maximizing um, the treatment um, goals of spleen reduction and symptom benefit. And therefore, um, the duration of therapy can be limited um, and the outcomes can be compromised for patients with myelofibrosis. So a, a different angle of looking at the way uh, modern JAK inhibitors are utilized in clinical practice and perhaps um, uh, highlighting the fact that there remains unmet needs, gaps in treatment, um, and um, the, uh, the need to optimize our therapeutic approach. And for this reason, we're going to get uh, deeper into it today. So these are the goals for the program today to help you improve your understanding of patient and disease related features of MF that can help guide the use of JAK inhibitor platforms uh, and the integration of transplantation, uh, enhance your understanding of the evidence supporting the use of JAK inhibitors in a range of patient populations and treatment settings. And lastly, to equip you with skills you need to develop personalized treatment plans uh, in transplant and non-transplant settings. So exploring the intersection of JAK inhibitor therapy and allotransplant, so this is our first case for today. Um, this is Michael. He is 56. Um, he presents with symptomatic myelofibrosis. His spleen on exam is 16 centimeters below the left costal margin. He complains of bone pains in his legs, mostly at night that, that um, interrupt his sleep. Uh, he has night sweats, sometimes drenching, that require changing of his pillowcase. He's profoundly fatigued and often finds himself napping during the middle of the day. And he's lost weight unintentionally and has early satiety due to the splenomegaly. His hemoglobin is 9.5 grams per deciliter, his white count is 24,000, his platelet count is 102,000, and on manual review of the purple blood smear, he has 2% blast. He's noted by mutational profiling to have a JAK2 V617F mutation, a TET2 mutation, and a high molecular risk mutation, ASXL1. 
So the first question here, is this patient eligible for transplantation? And if so, how would donor availability potentially influence the next steps and timing of therapy? And for this, I'm gonna uh, ask Aaron to jump in and give us a sense, like, is this a transplant candidate and what does it look like? And how does donor availability influence your decision-making? Absolutely, John. And, and really, as you mentioned, JAK inhibitor therapy and transplants do intersect. They're not mutually exclusive. So I definitely want to think in both of those veins here. But when you're thinking about a transplant and using transplant for an individual in their treatment plan, you want to think about two domains. One is their disease, how risky or how aggressive their disease might be in the near future. And certainly there are some things in the case you want to cue in on. Certainly the ASXL1 mutation, the anemia, the, the burgeoning thrombocytopenia and the symptomatic disease are all predictors for worse outcomes in the near future. And so this might tell you that this is a person who could benefit from transplant, not, a, not necessarily a low risk patient. The other thing is how healthy is this individual? Now it's a, the patient's 56, which is relatively young, not a lot of time to develop significant heart disease, liver disease, kidney disease that might preclude them from doing a transplant. And so, you know, as long as they're a relatively healthy person with high risk disease, and definitely want to think about transplant, just like you think about voting in Chicago, do it early and often. <laughs> Excellent. And, and how about the fact that you know, the patient has the splenomegaly, 16 centimeters, pretty big yeah. spleen. He's clearly symptomatic from it. He's lost weight. He's got early satiety. Um, so you, you, you see the patient, you, you, you think of this patient as a transplant eligible patient. You're starting to get the process ready. Do you intervene with the JAK inhibitor? What are your goals with the JAK inhibitor? And you know, how would you select a JAK inhibitor in this yeah. setting? Yeah, certainly just like any other patient, you want to optimize them prior to transplant, optimize their, their disease state. And so for this individual, he's probably, he's lost all this weight. He's probably a cactic. He's probably of a very high cytokines. Uh, and you want to, you want to reverse this and also potentially shrink his spleen, which will, I know we'll get into some details later on with that. So certainly a JAK inhibitor is the way to go. Of the three approved JAK inhibitors, you might be inclined to start with ruxolitinib for a number of reasons. One is that you, you know, there, that's the most data we have is ruxolitinib in the transplant versus the other JAK inhibitors. Secondly, you want to have the best chance at shrinking his spleen and improving his symptoms. And we think, you know, ruxolitinib would certainly be a good candidate there. And he's got, well, a relatively preserved platelet count. And so I think for all those reasons, you may select ruxolitinib as your first choice. Now, if the platelets were lower, you might go with procritinib. Uh, if this patient already had a JAK inhibitor, or for some reason you wouldn't want to give them ruxolitinib, uh, you know, potential side effects, what have you, you might reach for fedratinib in that case. Um, but again, there's less data for fedratinib and procritinib leading into transplant. And, and Aaron, when you start ruxolitinib, for example, in a patient like this, what is your goal in terms of, are you looking to get the spleen down to a certain threshold? What, what, how do you know you've had success before yeah. going to transplant? Yeah, there's, there's no great measure of success prior to transplant. You know, with most patients, as you know, uh, who start on a JAK inhibitor, we can see improvement pretty quickly, particularly with their symptoms and their spleen to follow. And so by the time you get the HLA typing done, you identify a donor, you start, you do all the insurance hurdles, you know, you'll, you'll have plenty of time there over those six to eight to even up to three months uh, six, eight, six to eight weeks, but maybe even three months to kind of get them tuned up for a transplant and get that maximum benefit. But with particular displaying size, there's no magic number or goal that we know of. There are a lot of studies that point to a 20 centimeter spleen as being kind of the toggle point between good and bad outcomes with patients with myelofibrosis who get transplant. But again, the data is quite mixed. Uh, for every study that shows a positive outcome, there's ones that show no benefit to spleen volume reduction prior to transplant. And we'll, we'll, we'll hit on that in, in future studies. And just to be clear to the audience, when you say 20 centimeters, are you talking by imaging modality, uh, by yeah. exam? That would be 20 centimeters by imaging modality. And then it, is your appetite, what's your appetite like for cytopenias in the setting? Like if, you, if you're trying to maximize like the yeah. JAK inhibitor and getting, do you accept a certain degree of anemia and thrombocytopenia? Yeah, and I think we do, right? So just like when we're giving AML therapies to a patient prior to transplant, we're just, we're going for broke. We're, we're pushing through the cytopenias. And I think in this case too, you would do that. If you're really heading towards transplant with this individual, you're going to push through the anemia, push through the thrombocytopenia in order to maximally reduce their cytokines, maximally improve their symptoms and maximally reduce their spleen. So um, we've talked about this, uh, this study before, Aaron. Maybe you can give the audience yeah. a sense of, of what we're looking at here in terms of retrospective data and putting this into context. Absolutely, John. So this is the CIBMTR report. Um, so CIBMTR is the Center for International Bone Marrow Transplant Research. It is a large, collect a large database, international database, in fact. Um, but all transplants done here in the United States are by law cataloged in the CIBMTR. So we can look at a national, really, 
transplant rate and national transplant outcomes. Uh, so really good data here, not just single center. So kind of filters out some of those that may be biases. And we can see here patients transplanted with myelofibrosis in the blue line and, and other MPNs in the green line. But the outcomes are actually surprise, would surprise most, I think. You know, I've definitely talked to referring docs and thinking that transplant outcomes for myelofibrosis are quite poor. But here we see a three-year survival probability of 66% for patients with myelofibrosis who get a matched related donor transplant and a three-year survival probability of 59% who with, get a matched unrelated donor transplant. So better than 50-50 even at three years. So you think about a, high, a super high-risk myelofibrosis, the median survival is going to be less than three years. So definitely improvements on what you would expect uh, how these patients to do over time. So I think one of the other points that we'd like to hit upon is in, in our field, as in many fields in oncology, there are prognostic scoring systems in, in myelofibrosis. There tends to be uh, many that have evolved over the years that integrate more uh, cytogenetic and molecular data. And here we have an interesting um, scoring system that's been developed specifically for risk scoring and categorizing patients prior to transplant. And I like this MTSS, the myelofibrosis transplant scoring system to help guide the discussion with the patient, to give them a sense of where they may fall on the spectrum of outcomes of patients with myelofibrosis. This was based off a, a European study uh, over multiple centers that had a um, that had a two cohorts, and one cohort actually ended up validating the data in multivariable analysis, identifying uh, independent uh, predictors of of adverse outcome in patients with myelofibrosis that received transplant. Um, and you can see the ones that that were statistically and and, and significantly uh, meaningful um, and scored and weighted by how meaningful that hazard ratio was. So, for example, patients who who did not have a calreticulin or MPL mutation uh, were weighted more heavily. Patients who received an HLA mismatched uh, unrelated donor were, were weighted more heavily. And, and the beautiful thing about these kind of calculators is you don't have to memorize them. They're, they're online and you can calculate them. And often my patients go online and calculate their, their risk score. So you can easily do these online if you have the data in front of you. Um, and what you can see from, um, from calculating is that there are four different uh, like discrete risk categories or risk groups that range from low intermediate, high, and very high. Um, and you can see that the, the probabilities of survival all the way on the right can vary pretty considerably from the low risk um, all the way down to you know, almost 30% um, in the very high risk group at five years. So this basically gives the patient a sense of where they might fall. And, and you have to be very careful with these scoring systems because it doesn't give the patient, the individual patient, um, a, an exact uh, framework of what their transplant could look like in outcome. It is a generality that patients that fall in these categories are more likely to have these kinds of, of outcomes. And I guess the obvious question for you, Aaron, is, is uh, you're, you're an MF expert and a, as you always say, recovering transplanter. <laughs> Do you use this and is it helpful in your conversations? Yeah, as you stated, I think this is helpful in counseling patients. So these are kind of the out, uh, outcomes that we'd expect after transplant based on the data we have. This, these uh, uh, factors used to, uh, to calculate this risk score are very similar to the MIPS 70 score or MIPS 70 version 2.0 score, which we often also use to dictate prognosis. Um, and, and as you suspect, patients who are low risk here with good performance status, low risk disease are gonna do the best. And those who have high risk disease and maybe not great performance status may not do as well. Um, so it does kind of give you a frame of reference of what to expect over time, as opposed to CIBMTR data, which is kind of like all comers. Excellent. Yeah, I, I find this one particularly helpful and, and sort of important to realize, regardless of whether you're primary myelofibrosis or secondary ET or PV related myelofibrosis, yeah. able to sort of formulate a discussion with the patient. Because I think one of the, the most challenging um, discussions often is with patients is, is how do you balance the, the, the potential benefits of transplant with the obvious risks that, that you know, exist? And is there a way to sort of tease that and, and walk patients through that conversation, which is really a conversation that occurs yeah. over multiple visits? Um, okay, so let's talk about spleen and, um, and myelofibrosis. So splenomegaly is obviously a major component um, driven by extramedullary hematopoiesis in myelofibrosis. Many of the patients that we see have splenomegaly and varying degrees of splenomegaly. And many of the patients that go on to get, um, to get transplants will also have splenomegaly. Um, and although I would say it's used less frequently today, splenectomy was often used in the past, particularly prior to the era of JAK2 inhibitors. And here's 
Here's an example of a retrospective study done through the EBMT, looking at um, over almost 1,200 patients who received uh, transplants for myelofibrosis, two, and two of which um, had a splenectomy before transplant. And this is an interesting analysis because if you compare the, um, and this is what the, the top line show, the, the, the outcomes of patients with uh, splenectomy versus uh, those that didn't get splenectomy, it wasn't quite obvious that there was a real benefit to, in all comers to, to performing a splenectomy prior to transplant. And obviously, the goal of a splenectomy prior to transplant would be to try to improve upon engraftment, you know, limit that duration of, of time where the patients are susceptible to infection, and hopefully get a more robust uh, engraftment um, in, the, in the bone marrow. If you look at the patients within this, uh, within this series that had, you know, particularly big spleens, greater than 15 centimeters, here is maybe where you saw the best benefit in terms of, of outcomes like, um, like survival. And, um, and you know, th this is an interesting study because it, it may suggest that there are some patients that could benefit from splenectomy before, surgery, uh, before uh, transplant, but it's not clear that every patient does. So how do you take this data, Aaron, and utilize it in clinical practice? Yeah, well, well thanks for that question. Um, I think it's incredibly important and it's an old question, something that's been, as you mentioned, bounced around forever in the transplant literature. And for every study that does show an improvement with splenectomy or, or, or somehow reducing spleen size, there's one that doesn't show any difference. So this one kind of does both in one study, I think. But clearly big spleens are bad, uh, whether that affects engraftment, complications such as liver thrombosis, uh, it so associates more closely with malnourishment and poorer performance status. Clearly bigger spleens are worse. It might also predict for more aggressive disease. But it's tricky to say, you know, you think about this study published, uh, it probably included some patients who didn't get JAK inhibitors as well. And yep. in the area of era of JAK inhibitors, how much can you improve upon that? I think, though, universally, it is agreed upon that you try to maximize disease response. And if you got a whopping spleen and someone's really deconditioned by that spleen, they're clearly not going to do well with transplant. So on an individual case-by-case -case basis, you sit down, well, is the spleen preventing you from getting to transplant? Is a question we often ask. And if the answer is yes, then, and, and the JAK inhibitors haven't worked, then we consider splenectomy in, in very, again, selected patients. Um, but uh, you know, in our anecdotal experience over the last couple of years, we've actually been able to get people to bridge over. Pa patients who were not great transplant candidates, we took their spleens out, they got a lot better, and they were able to go on to transplant and do quite well. And I think the, the important point too here is that if, if you're going to take a patient to transplant or, or not and, and move towards splenectomy, you really need a, a surgeon that has expertise oh, yeah. in taking out these big spleens because often the vasculature yeah. is complicated. The, the rates of, of uh, infection, um, thrombosis and bleeding could lead to 10% mortality. Um, and that, that really is best done at centers where there's a lot of uh, expertise in usually the big transplant centers yep. that do big organ transplants. And you really need a, an experienced surgeon for these kinds of big spleens. So um, here, here we're showing you the, the role of transplant and JAK inhibitors as, as sort of summarized by the, uh, the NCCN guidelines in which you're, you're one of the contributing authors. Um, you know, we're talking about patients who have intermediate to or higher risk disease by, by definition, no matter what, what scoring system you use, these are patients that have a more limited lifespan, usually less than five years. Um, and these patients are patients that would be considered transplant candidates. Generally speaking, if they have a good performance status, in most centers, if they're less than 70 years of, of age, and some other centers, even 70, you know, under 75 years of age, it's, you know, that we could probably have a whole discussion about whether age is the best surrogate marker for fitness for transplant. Um, but the, you know, the recommendations are to bridge therapy, uh, bridging therapy with a JAK inhibitor yep. are often used, um, and, and that's the first line of therapy to, to get patients to myelofibrosis, to uh, transplant from myelofibrosis. Now, there are patients that we see that have more of an accelerated phase or blast phase disease. These are patients that have increased blasts um, either in the bone marrow or in the peripheral blood or both. 10 to 19% defines accelerated phase and then 20% or greater is blast phase, which is essentially secondary AML to an MPN. And these are patients that really do poorly, particularly, well, I would say both groups do poorly, yeah. accelerated and blast phase patients. And the blast phase patients that we see with, with um, MPN blast phase really do worse than de novo AML patients. They, oh, yeah. they do not respond as well to therapy and their survival is really quite limited. So for patients that are transplant eligible, it's really a modality that really needs to be, um, to be optimized in these patients. And you know, I think the obvious question I'm going to ask you, Aaron, is if you have one of these patients that shows up that has, you know, PV-related myelofibrosis, 20% blast, really looks ill, um, and is a transplant candidate, and even has a donor, 
Are you using you know, induction chemotherapy to get them there? Are you giving them yeah. HMA-based therapy? What's your approach? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And, and, and there's a lot of recent data that's kind of driving some of these decisions. But you know, the, the first thing is, you know, I, as you mentioned, I really don't see much difference between accelerate and blast phase. I put it all in one bucket at that point. Yep. Uh, our, our standard care tends to be HMAs. Um, it, uh, I think there's less risk of complication. The responses that we see, if you see a response with induction chemotherapy is quite limited and usually not long enough to get them to transplant. I think the bigger question is, should we even be reducing these folks' disease at all? There's a really provocative paper that came in from that same German group showing that patients with blast phase MPN did just as well going right to transplant versus getting some sort of chemotherapy to disease reduce prior to transplant. So I, I think there's uh, there, there might be a role for just going straight to transplant, maybe getting things cooled off with a jack inhibitor first. Likewise, there was a, another analysis published in accelerated phase disease showing the same thing. And so the big question is, should you do chemotherapy? I think as of now, most transplanters do want some disease reduction, get those blasts under 10%, maybe even 5%. And really HMAs, hypomethylene agents, plus or minus a JAK inhibitor is definitely the way to go. And maybe you can take us through, um, through this analysis, which is another EBMT yeah. registry analysis. Yeah, so the EMP, EBMT is similar to the CIBMTR is, again, a large registry database uh, for European patients who are undergo transplantation, so a, a large repository, um, data from all across uh, uh, you know, Western Europe. Um, and, and so in this analysis, there was 586 patients. Um, some got ruxolitinib before transplant, some did not. And uh, some stopped rux uh, prior to, to transplant for various non-transplant reasons. Some obviously started as they moved into their conditioning. Uh, they show here the responses. So not a lot of great responses, but you know, 50 50% 50 reduction in palpable spleen length here. So which is you know similar to a 35% volume response. Um, and really they kind of looked at these outcomes post-transplant. And when RUX came on the scene, there was a lot of questions. Will RUX increase the risk of graft versus disease? Will you know increase the risk of graft failure? No one knew how it was really going to kind of play out there. So the studies like this really kind of set the scene where. RUX is something quite feasible that we can do prior to tra transplant to optimize folks. Simply, if we think about reducing spleen size, improving performance status, and the like, um, it didn't really seem in this analysis to have a lot of effect on graft versus host disease. And as you, as many of you may know, ruxolitinib is also approved to treat graft versus host disease nowadays. And so, you know, based on this, it seems like RUX was feasible prior to transplant may not impact outcomes largely, but may have been able to get people to transplant. And the ultimate question is, should we do, say, a transplant sandwich with ruxolitinib bread you know, before and after transplant to minimize graft versus host disease as well as to improve, improve post-transplant outcomes? And, and when using rux prior to transplant, what's your strategy in terms of, um, do you use it right up to conditioning? Yeah. Do you taper it? Do you overlay it? So, you know, there's been a number of different studies looking at this. There's no right answer. Personally, I like to stop it right when they get admitted for their conditioning. Um, I don't really want to try to taper it off and run the risk of them feeling worse or having cytokine storm or rebound symptoms prior to transplant. And Ruxolib has an incredibly short half-life. So if you stop it the day before admission, it will be out of the system. There will be no drug-drug interactions. And then the next day, you're generally starting your busulfin prior to transplant which I honestly can't think of a better drug to treat MPNs than busulfan. Uh, it just has a lot of side effects, of course. And so that'll usually cut the disease before there's time for the, uh, the cytokines and the, the symptoms to come back. Excellent. And, and, and maybe take us through, you know, so it, what, was the, what was the outcome of the study in terms of RUX and, and, and RUX response versus not getting RUX? Well, the, the short story here is folks who had a nice response to ruxolitinib prior to transplant did better. And that makes sense, right? So you can optimize the patient prior to transplant, lower the cytokine levels, shrink the spleens, make them feel better, get their performance status better. Therefore, patients do better. Um, you know, it, it may have effect on relapse uh, in the upper right-hand corner. You, there's like, there's a kind of an interesting trend there. It's hard to say, does this truly affect the rux or is the rux response to selecting patients out who may have less aggressive disease. Um, and, and so I, you know, this type of study doesn't answer that question, but certainly an intriguing result there. You know, overall survival and showing the right, lower right-hand corner, no significant difference in overall survival, but maybe with increased numbers, we might see those, uh, those curves play out a little bit more.
you know, my take, if you, if you look at the data that we have, whether it's retrospective data like this, or even some of the prospective studies of using RUCs prior to transplant, I think that we, we, can, we can say a couple of things. And one is that it's safe to do, um, and it, it often enables patients that might be falling apart who couldn't get the transplant yep. to get the transplant. It doesn't seem to have a negative impact really on transplant outcomes. But how much it actually improves uh, the actual ultimate outcomes, I think, is, is a little bit unclear. Yeah, absolutely. So here's, you know, here's one abstract that was presented uh, at ASH. Um, and this is a small, small look at um, a real world data set through the Cardinal Health System, looking at patients who received fedratinib. And these are patients who are typically receiving fedratinib after ruxolitinib. Um, and, and then highlighting, um, I think it was like 12 patients that actually received fedratinib and then went on to transplant. Um, and, and this was a, a group of patients that uh, were treated in, in community settings um, and had a, I think it was a, a median follow-up of about nine and nine and a half months. Um, and we were looking at whether, you know, this is a feasible um, way of getting patients to transplant. And of course, there's all these caveats when you look at, um, at data through a, you know, through a medical record where you're abstracting data. Um, and it's never, you know, it's never perfect. But what we could see was that fedratinib was able to, as the data from the prospective phase two study uh, would demonstrate, was able to reduce um, spleen size and in, improve symptom burden. And in this patient population was able to get patients uh, without um, in, in, inducing or incurring a lot of cytopenias or complications to transplant. So small series of about 12 patients, but I, I, as far as I'm aware, the only, you know, the only data that we have out there, and as yeah. you you pointed out, you know, right now the, the overwhelming bulk of data of JAK inhibition prior to transplant sits for obvious reasons with ruxolitinib. So it's important for us to, to also characterize, you know, what happens to patients who get fedratinib now, picritinib, maybe one day mamalotinib as they move to transplant. And, you know, can we, do we have data that tells us that we can do that safely and, and effectively? And I think this just gives you another option to optimize folks before a transplant, right? So if ruxolitinib isn't quite cutting the mustard, you, you, you got another thing you tool you can reach for other than splenectomy to get them there. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's nice to practice in a, in a period where we have options and it's not, nice <laughs> so, I mean, I remember the days when there were no Jack inhibitors and now there's three approved Jack inhibitors soon to be probably four. So it does provide us the ability to, to customize um, therapy. And that's the, the title of our next slide, customizing Jack inhibitor therapy in patients in this case who are ineligible for transplant. All right, great. So, you know, as we move from a, a case-based discussion that's transplant oriented, I'm going to switch it over to you, Aaron, now to talk about a, a non-transplant eligible patient. Yeah. And so this patient here is a 56-year-old pre patient presenting with symptomatic myelofibrosis, spleen, 16 centimeter, bone pain, night sweats, fatigue, weight loss. Sounds very familiar from the other case. <laughs> but maybe, maybe this person's got really bad kidneys, right? So you can't do a transplant if you got bad kidneys because you'll never get them their tacrolimus. Uh, their hemoglobin's the same at nine and a half. Their white count's 24. Platelets are 102 with 2% circulating blast. Again, the mutation panel shows a JAK2 V617F, a TET2 mutation, uh, mutation, and that high risk ASXL1 mutation. So, again, the same exact patient, maybe some kidney disease exclusion from transplant. Uh, maybe not. Uh, maybe they, got, they just don't want to do transplant. Uh, they, they elected not to, or, or they don't have a donor that's available. So, this patient here, um, you know, you can think about a number of different treatment options. As we talked before, there are three approved JAK inhibitors. There are even clinical trials to consider. You know, John, so this, this patient comes to see you and says, I'm, I don't want to get a transplant. Uh, I'm a young, otherwise healthy person. I want to uh, optimize my non-transplant therapies. What's some, what would be some things you'd consider for this, this person? Yeah, and, you know, as you pointed out, this happens. I mean, sometimes we get patients that we would think would be great transplant candidates, but they're not on the transplant train and, yeah. and they want to do non trans which is totally fine. So yeah. I think as long as patients are informed, they understand that whatever we're doing is, you know, not, does not have a curative intent, you know, I think that that's, that's an appropriate uh, approach. And in this patient, you know, as you pointed out, this is a symptomatic patient who's going to continue to do worse if we don't, if we don't turn it around. So this would be a great, you know, JAK inhibitor, first line therapy type of patient with a platelet count of 102,000, really, you get, you got your opening for ruxolitinib. Um, one could use fedratinib, that label is agnostic of line of therapy. Um, although I would point out to the listener that, you know, procritinib is technically approved for patients less than 50,000. I, for one, would, would not hesitate to actually use picritinib in a patient who has 102,000 platelets because the reality is if you use ruxolinib or fedratinib, particularly if you're trying to maximize the dose, you, you will incur 
and, and as expected, some degree of thrombocytopenia. So I really think this patient could get any of the three JAK inhibitors in reality by, by FDA label, probably ruxolitinib and experience. Ruxolitinib is probably going to be the first choice. I'm a start low and titrate up kind of guy. So I would do five milligrams twice daily and then quickly get to 10 twice daily, which I think is the sweet spot. And then if there's room to play, try to get it higher yeah. to try to maximize uh, spleen reduction. But um, I also like pedratinib, to be honest. I think that's also a reasonable option up front. Although, you know, I think as, as we'll point out, you know, the, the biggest amount of data is really for pedratinib is second line after ruxolitinib. We don't have data for rux second line after pedratinib. Yeah. Uh, here we got the uh, guidelines for myelofibrosis again from the NCCN, the version from March of 22. Uh, looking at uh, transplant eligibility baseline uh, and, and platelets can help kind of inform your choices. And, and certainly, again, any high-risk patient who, uh, who, who is a good candidate for transplant, you really want to start going down that road and adding in JAK inhibitors. But outside of that, we often use platelet counts to kind of start to parse out who could uh, get which JAK inhibitor and where. And we think about, as John mentioned earlier, patients with platelet counts less than 50,000 kind of heading more towards pacritinib where platelets greater than 50,000, you know, thinking more of ruxolitinib or fedratinib in the front line. You know, I would also want to point out in the guidelines, we try to emphasize clinical trial, clinical trial, clinical trial. I mean, it is a boon to have now three approved, maybe four in the future JAK inhibitors, but certainly we need more therapies. We're, we're not quite uh, on par with say like multiple myeloma or breast cancer quite yet. Uh, so, so definitely new therapies are needed. And, and Aaron, because you, you're on the, the, the committee that makes these guidelines, one, one thing I've always wanted to ask you is if you look at the, the way the guideline is set up and it says like platelets less than 50,000, transplant candidate, and then it's like a direct uh, you know, arrow to allo transplant. But wouldn't there also potentially be a role for pacritinib again in this discussion of, of you know, um, pre-transplant jack? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the, that's the kind of flaw of guidelines, right? You, you, you have to make this black and white very simple to follow, something that fits on a sheet of paper algorithm. And, you know, the, to capture the nuances of caring for myelofibrosis is really hard to do in such a, such a manner. Um, and, and now with, you know, momolotinib potentially getting approved, we're, I think we're just going to have to blow this whole thing up and start <laughs> over almost. Yeah, uh, that, it does make it more complicated. It totally makes it more complicated. But, you know, the point, I think the point to bring up here, though, is, you know, partnering with a, with a center who, you know, that takes care of a lot of patients with myelofibrosis, right? So working on those collaborations, I think, can be key. You know, talking to your colleagues, what, what would you do in this situation? Um, you know, those experiences are invaluable. And so, you know, certainly when you, when you start a patient on JAK inhibitor, you're going to want to monitor them uh, in terms of their response. And uh, just to give you kind of idea of what to expect, you know, we've talked a lot about Ruxolinib having the most data. Here's kind of the, the headline uh, data, if you will, for ruxolitinib. And this is from the Comforts 2 study ran where patients were randomized between ruxolitinib and best available therapy at the time. Uh, and it shows the degree of spleen volume reduction. And so the bars going down show improvement from baseline. And you can see the majority of patients on ruxolitinib had some improvement, uh, which is quite remarkable. And there's that 35% decrease in spleen volume, which is a somewhat arbitrary number, but roughly correlates with a 50% reduction in palpable length. And that's certainly clearly contrasting with what we're seeing here for the best available therapy in the blue line. Uh, there was a, a real world survival analysis done in patients with uh, intermediate to high risk myelofibrosis, looking at the uh, impact of ruxolitinib approval. To me, this speaks volumes, right? So in the right-hand side, you sh there are three curves, the green curve, pre-approval, ruxolitinib unexposed, of course, orange curve, post-approval, ruxolitinib unexposed, and then blue line, post-approval ruxolitinib exposed. So there was an improvement in survival clearly after ruxolitinib was approved, even in patients who didn't get ruxolitinib. So not only did ruxolitinib improve spleens and symptoms and maybe survival, but it's also improving awareness. I think it's improving their ability to diagnose this disease and recognize it and care for the symptomatic parts of the disease and other bits and pieces that go along with this. So, so it, it, it's certainly done a lot for the field and I don't really wanna belittle that since we got new JAK inhibitors now, uh, it was certainly a, a watershed moment, if you will. Um, and like, again, we've been talking, there are other JAK inhibitors on the scene. There's Jakarta, which is an upfront study for patients with myelofibrosis. So fedratinib versus placebo here, uh, showing the two curves. Uh, uh, this was a contemporary study uh, of, the, of the comfort studies, but was published much later due to a, a clinical hold on fedratinib over a concern of Wernicke's. But the key piece here with this data is, 
you know, Fedranib did a bang up job reducing spleen volumes. And that's shown in the figure A here. Uh, a significant proportion of patients had at least a 35% reduction in their spleen volume, where most patients had some improvement uh, compared to placebo not performing that well as one may expect. Um, so really a, a very, very highly active drug, uh, a, a contemporary drug too, to ruxolitinib. Yeah, what I want to also just point out here, Aaron, in this in this figure, which I think is important for the you know the listener and the audience to see, is if you look at the placebo on the right, what's really interesting and often not emphasized is that's the natural history of the disease within a six month yep. period. You you see that spleen you know increasing, so it sort of it really reinforces the fact that this disease is is both chronic and progressive, and patients really just do poorly if not on an active agent. And, and as you pointed out, fedratinib is really active here. Yeah, there's not a lot of data on it, but you know spleen stabilization. Uh, there's probably some benefit there, right? Even though it's not getting necessarily smaller, hitting this 35% spleen volume reduction. You know, the spleens that don't get any bigger are probably better. And, you know, I think there's a lot to the quality of the spleen too. I'm really getting the weeds here, but, you know, a lot of times patients on jack inhibitors, their spleen won't get smaller, but it may get softer, smushier, if you will. Uh, can alleviate mm -hmm. a lot of the symptoms, maybe improve their ability to eat uh, and, and improve their weight and, and reduce their early satiety. So I think there's a lot that's not even resp of response that's not even captured in these figures. So J in Jakarta, we not, um, also saw a, 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 an improvement in progressing pre-survival shown here. Um, you know, again, this is a kind of a, a tough thing to show with all the holds that happened and, and then the randomized crossover nature of these studies. Um, but, but, you know, certainly there may be some benefit again to, to, to long-term jack inhibition inhibition. Now, the transformation to AML was pretty low in this population, so that's kind of something hard to really measure, but, but clearly patients who were getting fedratinib did much better over a long period of time than, than those getting placebo. So kind of re reiterating that theme. And then, so the, so ruxolitinib was approved, then fedratinib approved, but the new kid on the block, relatively speaking, is pacritinib. And uh, so I'm going to throw it back to you, John, since you led a lot of the studies and development of pacritinib. Uh, just to kind of tell us a little bit more about uh, what was done with the drug. So, so pacritinib has, has a, a long uh, development pathway in which uh, as a JAK2, IRAC1, uh, FLT3 inhibitor, it was appreciated that it was less myelosuppressive than some of the other JAK inhibitors in development. So it ultimately culminated in this uh, phase three persist two trial. And this was specifically in patients with platelet counts less than 100,000. Uh, these would have been patients that would have been excluded from the, the original Comfort 1 and Comfort 2 trials. These are patients who had symptom and spleen burden, um, and they could have seen a prior JAK inhibitor, and about half the patients did, and they were randomized one to one to one to, to PAC 400 once daily, PAC 200 twice daily, or best available ther therapy, which could also include a JAK inhibitor. And again, almost half the patients got a JAK inhibitor. Mm -hmm. So this was a really challenging patient population, very advanced. Low platelets is a, is a marker for advanced and, and ill patients with myelofibrosis, and a very stringent co-primary endpoint of spleen volume reduction and, and total symptom scores, co-primary endpoints here at six months. Um, and what we saw with this trial, what we saw with this trial was um, pacritinib was superior to best available therapy in terms of spleen volume reduction at the 200 milligram twice daily. So that was the one of the arms. 22% um, met that endpoint versus 3% in BAT. If you look at symptom improvement of 50% or greater, which is the regulatory benchmark, 35% versus 14%. Um, and if you focus in, and this is what the FDA was very intent on, focusing in on patients with platelets less than 50,000 why it's an unmet need. We, we, don't, we didn't have a JAK inhibitor that was approved for this patient population. And this drug was, was uniquely suited, probably for molecular reasons, uniquely suited for treating patients with this low platelet. And if you look at the, the uh, analysis of these low platelet patients from Persist2, it was a 29% SBR, 35% or greater versus 3% and a 26% versus 9% TSS50. So you know, very good perspective data demonstrating the ability to deliver at the full dose, 200 twice daily, um, spleen and symptom relief in these patients that would normally not be eligible for, for these treatments. I think the other thing to point out too, and this particularly becomes relevant as we talk about uh, mamalotinib and other drugs to address anemia, there was an anemia response seen here in 25% of treated patients with pacritinib, both in terms of uh, clinical improvement in anemia, two grams per deciliter, increase in hemoglobin, or conversion of transfusion dependence to independence. And in patients who continue to need transfusions, there was a lessening 
of the units per month that were acquired uh, after the six month uh, follow up period um, with pacritinib. So uh, not just spleen and symptom, not, not just the ability to deliver in low platelets at the full dose, but in a proportion of patients improving um, their anemia or at least reducing their transfusion burden, which is, a, which is an important goal in many patients. Um, this drug is also, as I mentioned, a FLT3 inhibitor. There's some GI toxicity that can be associated in about half the patients. It's usually low-grade nausea or diarrhea, um, very easy to manage with some um, anti-emetic or, or anti-diarrheal. It typically occurs in the first one to two months, is rarely a reason for discontinuation. We didn't see um, concerning signals of activity uh, or signals of toxicity with neurologic adverse events, um, opportunistic infections. The, the, I think the two things to be aware of, there was a clinical hold that was placed on the drug, uh, initial concerns from interim analysis of safety and outcome. And when the, when the dust settled and that, that data set was fully analyzed, what was clear was there was not an increased risk of cardiovascular events necessarily compared to best available therapy, including ruxolinib, but maybe an increased risk of bleeding. And this is an interesting you know, phenomenon that's not clearly understood why. It's not clearly related to the depth of thrombocytopenia. Maybe it's qualitative platelet defect. Um, issue, but one should be aware when prescribing procretinib to be aware of the potential for bleeding. So I'm careful in patients who have a history of significant bleeding, have an undiagnosed coagulopathy or bleeding disorder, um, and um, and I, I really try to optimize those patients and and make sure I'm balancing the potential benefits and risks um, in terms of bleeding. But this is remains a, a great option and the only option for patients with less than fifty thousand, despite these risks. Yeah, and I think a key point there, as you said, in the inclusion criteria for the persist too, is the fact that it included patients up to a play count of 100,000, right? So certainly you can think about patients uh, in that setting and try and getting, uh, you know, getting the therapy for them. Because if you start another jacket, their platelets are likely to drop. Um, you know, I, I've had some success, I don't know if you've had lately, uh, using, you know, procritinib in second line, even with patients with play accounts between 50 and 100,000. So I'm, I'm starting, I feel like I'm starting to crack that barrier a little bit in getting the drug to patients. The other thing too to point out is and I've seen this with, and you know, it's somewhat anecdotal, but I'll say it out loud here. I've seen with some of the patients that I've treated, particularly for longer terms, is that you can actually see an improvement in platelet count over time. Yeah. So you get this reduction in spleen and symptom burden, you get this anemia response, and then you actually can see platelets that go from sometimes single digit or low double digits to, you know, 50, yeah. 75,000. It's, it's, it's pretty a, impressive. Yeah. I've definitely had a few patients like that too. And uh, and, and you mentioned the hold too. I think the most impressive for, thing for me with the hold is when we had to stop drugging a lot of patients, a lot of patients did quite poorly uh, with immediately stopping the drug, uh, suggesting that they were significantly benefiting from it. So, uh, uh, you know, that, that will forever stick in my mind uh, with Pacritinib. Yeah, that was a challenging time for sure. It was. Uh, and, and likewise, it was, it was pretty challenging with, with Fedratinib was held for, for some time. You know, we definitely desperately wanted a new agent, particularly in the second line setting. Uh, and, and luckily, we have the Jakarta 2 to give us that, uh, that data. And, uh, you know, Jakarta 2 was done with uh, very, how you, I should say, loosey-goosey uh, <laughs> definitions for uh, ruxolitinib failure. Um, again, focus on this post-ruxolitinib population. And it was reanalyzed with kind of more stringent definitions of what are, uh, you know, ruxolitinib failures or ru ruxolitinib intolerance. And, you know, the kind of key piece of this reanalysis that was done by uh, Claire Harrison and colleagues was that the, you know, the responses were quite similar. It wasn't that the patients were totally cherry picked, but there clearly is clinical activity for fedratinib after ruxolitinib. I, I think you can speculate why, um, you know, the difference in inhibition of JAK1 versus not JAK1, and then maybe some target off-target effects on FLT3, if you will. Um, but clearly patients who are on ruxolitinib and were who, who actually had responses and lost those responses can regain those with, by switching over fedratinib. So to me, that, that's kind of the key take-home point from this. There is the FREEDOM study, uh, which was a kind of a, a post-approval uh, requirement from the regulatory authority which is to continuously look at fedratinib. Uh, and that's an ongoing study to really kind of better understand uh, you know, the, the role of fedratinib can, can play for, for patients with myelofibrosis. So these are kind of some of the patients that were enrolled. Not a lot of patients, of course, because after approval, it's hard to enroll patients onto a study like this. Um, but, you know, responses here are, are, are nicely durable. And I think that's kind of the key take home point for me uh, from this analysis in, in, in the Freedom Study. Uh, along that same vein, uh, it doesn't seem to be any new toxicity emerging uh, with long-term use of hydratinib. Again, like procretinib, it was put on a hold. And so, 
the, the long-term data uh, isn't as robust as say with, with bruxolitinib. And so it's, it's comforting, if you will, to see <laughs> uh, good uh, durability of response as well as no accumulatory, uh, accumulating toxicity. The one thing I'll point out here are the, the GI uh, toxicities. Uh, quite a bit of nausea and diarrhea are seen with this uh, due to the effect on FLT3 largely. Um, and so certainly when you start a patient on fedratinib, you know, I, I, I always recommend uh, Imodium as well as uh, having an anti-emetic at the ready. So we're going to pivot a little bit next from drugs that are already approved to drugs that may be on the horizon. The top of the list is momolotinib, uh, which is another JAK inhibitor. Um, but, you know, in earlier trials was shown to have a positive effect on anemia through inhibition of ACVR1, also known as uh, ALK2, which can regulate hepcidin. So we're, we're, we're harnessing the power of hepcidin to improve the inflammatory component of anemia. So Momentum was a randomized trial of patients previously exposed to jack inhibitor who had symptomatic anemic myelofibrosis, including patients with platelet counts down to 25,000. They're randomized in a two-to-one fashion between momolot and danazol. Danazol was chosen because it is an active agent in treating anemia in myelofibrosis. At week 24, patients were allowed to cross over to open-label momolotinib. And here's the top line data that was uh, just accepted and published in Lancet, uh, showing the spleen volume responses for momolotinib on the left and, and uh, on the right um, for danazol. So there were a few responses for danazol, but, but a largely a much larger proportion of patients had spleen volume responses to momolotinib. Not surprising since momolotinib is a JAK inhibitor and danazol is not. Um, so again, no big surprises there. So of course, the, the focus of this study was looking at transfusion independence rates. So the proportion of patients who weren't requiring transfusions at week 24. And on the right-hand side of this slide, you can see uh, the, the transfusion independence rate at baseline and week 24 for momolotinib in the blue and danazol in the red. So clearly a, a significant improvement in transfusion independence for momolotinib over danazol visually here. Um, although the analysis was a non-inferiority study when we term in terms of the statistical analysis. But certainly visually here, uh, momolotinib wasn't any worse than danazol, maybe a little bit better, um, but also had the significant spleen volume and symptom burden reduction. So here's a little slide to kind of go over some practical guidance on delivering therapy with JAK inhibitor uh, platforms. Um, uh, you know, considering starting doses and some safety uh, considerations, but John Yari brought up uh, some of the stuff uh, with pacritinib. Uh, we discussed the, you know, the, some of the, the GI toxicities with fedratinib. And, and uh, John, you also mentioned too early on that you kinda, you're kind of a start low guy. Um, so the package insert here, you know, bases the dosing of ruxolitinib uh, on the platelet count. Um, but, but John, you, you mentioned you start everyone at a low dose. I, I start a lot of patients with a low dose. I definitely don't follow for the hundred to 200. I really almost never start at 15. I'll, I'll usually start somewhere between five and 10 twice a day and titrate up. You know, I think for, for me, the, the message to, to those that are prescribing Rux is, is you want to maximize the dose, but I, I don't know that you need to start at a maximum dose. I think you need to start because every patient's a little bit different. Some patients really sort of drop their hemoglobin and platelet yeah. count. And, and you, you need to coach the patient because some patients, if they don't understand that by inhibiting JAK2 with ruxolinib, you are going to get some treatment emergent and it's very predictable anemia and thrombocytopenia. It sometimes can freak patients out and they can, they can you know, drop the therapy and, and not really get the benefit of the therapy. So I tend to ease some patients in and, and titrate up. And um, you know, I, think, I, I think that the, the dosing, I, I personally think that the dosing schema in the, in the label is a little too aggressive in my mind. Yeah, it's pretty steep, you know, and, and likewise, I, I often hold back, you know, these patients who have kind of burgeoning thrombocytopenia, I'll start off, you know, often with 10 twice a day, uh, sometimes five twice a day too. Uh, you know, we also want to, you, know, you know, not ignore the risk of some infection complications, increased risk of shingles, you know, tuberculosis reactivation, hepatitis virus reactivation, but there's been some scuttlebutt, if you will, about the risk of lymphoma with JAK inhibitors. Uh, John, kind of what's your take on, on the risk of lymphoma with JAK inhibitors, particularly ruxolitinib? Yeah, there was an initial report, you know, JAK inhibitors, but rux specifically is, is yeah. known to be an immunosuppressive drug. It does affect T cell and dendritic cell function. Uh, it may allow for the escape of, of, you know, lymphomas, as was first reported by a European group in a, in a very small percentage of patients. That hasn't been replicated, actually, in other studies. Um, and and uh, Rajit Rampal and I did a 
a, a dual institution study and, and also didn't see that signal of, of risk of lymphoma. So I, I'm not really sure. I, I don't check for, um, you know, for signs of B-cell malignancy before, um, before starting my patients on ruxolitinib. I've not encountered this to be a real problem. And as you know, there is an increased risk at baseline of having uh, malignancies, but even B-cell malignancies in myelofibrosis patients. So to me, it's not really an obstacle or, or a major concern when treating patients with RUX. Absolutely. And then uh, with, with fedratinib, so the recommended dose per the package insert is 400 milligrams orally uh, once daily. Um, and then if, if we mentioned the frequency and severity of GI side effects. So, you know, again, I often get patients a prescription for some Zofran or Adenzatron, and then tell them to have some Imodium in the uh, medicine cabinet ready to go. Um, and then there's also with the wor wor worry over Wernicke's encephalopathy in the back black box warning, you know, we'll check thiamine levels before starting and periodically during treatment. Um, I often just tell patients, just take thiamine supplement, um, just better safe than sorry. It's a water soluble vitamin, vitamin, you can go ahead and take it quite safely. I don't know, John, do you recommend your patients to take thiamine when on fedratinib? Yeah, I think it's like a low hanging fruit. So you take a little vitamin B1. I've not encountered this to be a problem in any patient I've treated. So yeah, pretty, pretty easy to get through. And, and the, the other point maybe to make with, with any of these drugs, but for Dratib, since we've got the slide is, is, um, is don't, don't manipulate the dose. So if it's 400 milligrams once daily, it comes in hundred milligram capsules, have the patient do 400 milligrams once daily. What I sometimes see is patients will sometimes take it upon themselves. They'll, they'll split <laughs> the dose to 200 twice daily. And that's yeah. pharmacokinetically, pharmacodynamically, that is not the way to give the drug yeah. and you compromise the activity. So use it at the first, you know, at the, at the full dose and, and, and proceed with, with confidence. Personally, I think patients do better with food and particularly in the evening is my, yep. my gut feeling with the drug. I concur on both those points. Um, I have most of my patients take it in the evening and with food too. Uh, do you do you low, do you start off at a lower dose of fedratinib, or do you come in at the full four hundred for all patients, independent of uh, platelet count? Yeah, I mean that that's one of the things that makes at least this drug compared to Rux maybe a little bit user friendly. I, I just use the full four hundred milligrams, and there's nice data actually. So you know the Jakarta study, as you pointed out, did allow for patients with platelet counts even as low as fifty thousand. So there is nice data there that you can deliver the four hundred milligrams even in the fifty to hundred thousand. So I give it at the full dose. Yeah. And, and it's a good point. So the package inserts, uh, you know, bruxolitib and fedratinib are approved for all patients with, you know, high-risk patients with myelofibrosis, but the package insert, there's no guidance on how to dose when platelet counts are less than 50,000, which of course opened up the window for picritinib. Uh, it has a recommended dosage of 200 milligrams orally twice daily. Uh, of course, in, the, in, the, in studies, you know, there was a once daily 400 dose given, but that was not the optimal dose. And there was the PAC-203 study that looked at lower dose, and clearly there is a dose response curve. Um, and so doses less than 200 milligrams twice daily uh, don't, don't perform as well. Um, and of course, as you mentioned, there's the, the worry about increased bleeding risk. And so you want to watch your patients closely there. Uh, like Fedratinib, there's a picritinib does hit FLT3, so there is significant uh, rates of diarrhea. Uh, so likewise, I, I recommend my patients have Imodium on the ready. Um, and, and there's also the special uh, guidance on uh, monitoring the QTC. So John, John with picritinib, do you, do you monitor QTC regularly in these folks? I have to say not, not totally. We do get an EKG up front to make sure someone doesn't have an already prolonged QTC, and then we will yep. get it intermittently. I've not seen it be a problem. I am careful though, I will say, of reviewing with the pharmacist whether there are any potential you know, drug-drug interactions yeah. that could prolong the QTC, but uh, you know, otherwise pretty easy to, to, to manage. Yeah. And, and, and like you, I overemphasize with picritinib and fedratinib the potential for GI toxicity. I find that if you overemphasize it, and you give them an anti-emetic and anti-diarrheal, they're less likely to come back with, with those complaints. And <laughs> I think so. usually it's low grade and, and not really a major yeah. reason for concern. Yeah. Yeah. Likewise, I'll get an EKG at baseline. I usually don't check it too much often afterwards. I will avoid QTC prolonging agents. Um, but you know, in the PAC-203 study, we really didn't see much of the way of QTC prolongation at all. Of course, though, uh, you know, JAK inhibitors are fantastic about we're trying to do new and better things. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the point of this slide is Jack uh, is myelofibrosis is not CML. It's not a one hit wonder where we give a single drug and, uh, you know, effectively or functionally cure these folks. Multiple pathways are deranged. And so there are a lot of different ways to target this disease to improve outcomes with or without Jack inhibition. Um, and so it lends itself well, uh, you know, the Jack inhibitors being a, an effective therapy that can improve symptoms and spleen volumes and maybe some survival 
but it provides a wonderful platform for combinatory therapies. And just some of it's shown here in the slide, different pathways we can attack. And um, so there, there are uh, a lot of new uh, modalities moving forward. Um, here's, a, here's a couple of examples uh, we'll go over here. Um, and one is uh, add-on therapy. I would say that this is kind of one of the more common strategies that we use in, in clinical trials in myelofibrosis, where patients may have be losing their response or have a suboptimal response and will add on top a new agent like nevidoclax, was shown here that can you know, enhance what we're doing for the disease and maybe increase the number of responses or, or regain, a, a, regain back a response that was lost. Um, you know, we hope that these drugs can fundamentally change the disease on a, on, on a very deep level, right? So with JAK inhibitors, you know, survival might be better uh, based on some, some cohort studies or some real world data, what have you, but, you know, no one's thinking it's clearing out, you know, a ton of myeloid fibrosis cells and reversing the pathology of the disease, but we're hoping these new agents can. And one of those agents is certainly Intellistat. And so, um, you know, I'll kind of throw it over to you, John, because I know you're, you're leading a lot of the work with Intellistat and, and kind of explain what it is and, and why might it work in myeloid fibrosis. So this is an infusional drug. It's a telomerase inhibitor. It essentially inhibits an enzyme that's constitutively activated in, in myelofibrosis stem cells and only transiently in normal stem cells. And, and telomeres are these repeats at the ends of chromosomes. And every time a cell divides, it loses a, a portion of these repeats, these telomere caps, gets to a critical threshold and the cell uh, is, is no longer able to, it gets into a quiescent state or is induced to undergo apoptosis. And what imatilstat does is it, it basically, um, changes the playing field um, and, and allows for you know attrition of those um, those telomeres in in the myelofibrosis stem cells and accelerates their their death preferential to normal cells. And a lot of great preclinical data that's been generated by by colleagues like Ron Hoffman um, and, and our group at Sinai demonstrating the ability to to significantly impair the myelofibrosis stem cell population. The original study done by Yellow Teferi showed um, complete responses, which we typically don't see in myelofibrosis and even molecular responses. So here's an example of a multi-center phase two study randomized to two different doses of a metal stack given every three weeks. And what we saw was that the spleen responses were, were modest, as you can see. The symptom responses were actually comparable to what you see in second line jack inhibitors, about 30%. But what was really, I think, most um, uh, most notable was there was a survival benefit here. Um, in the second line setting, when you fail ruxolitinib, these are patients who are relapse refractory, two rux, single agent metal stat. The expected survival, from maybe four or five studies uh, presented and published now, is about 12 to 15 months. And at the active dose of 9.4 milligrams per kilogram IV every three weeks, we saw a survival that was closer to 30 months. That got a lot of interest because that survival was also very well linked in the study to biomarkers like reduction in telomerase activity, telomere length, um, and, and AUC um, with, uh, with spleen symptom and survival, um, as well as uh, linking both reduction in bone marrow fibrosis, which occurred in about 42% of patients, uh, reduction in jack to allele burden or driver mutation burden and um, these outcome measures like survival. So this study has now moved into a phase three randomized in the in the refractory RUX uh, myelofibrosis patient a metal stat versus best available therapy, which excludes a jack inhibitor with a primary endpoint of overall survival. That's really a, a first in this uh, in this field. Yeah, I think it's exciting to finally have a trial with with that as a primary endpoint. You know, we've been we've been doing the spleen and symptom volume responses for so long. It, it's it's actually true. It's quite exciting to see that. Agreed. So um, I think we're we're coming to the to the end of our our program. What I love about this discussion was we we took the the participant today through, you know, the, what does it look like for a patient who's transplant eligible, the considerations in terms of spleen reduction, splenectomy, JAK inhibitor therapy, you know, does it actually impact uh, outcomes, uh, patients who have accelerated or blast phase disease, the use of maybe HMA plus a, a, a JAK inhibitor, um, and then, and then the, the many exciting JAK inhibitor options that we have available soon to have that may fill these niches with thrombocytopenia, anemia, second line options, all of which can be used and sequenced prior to transplant. Um, and it really just Im improves our armamentarium and our, and our, appre or our treatment uh, mm -hmm. approach for this very heterogeneous group of patients that we call myelofibrosis. And I'm, I'm most excited for the future because as you pointed out, there's so many different clinical trials that are harnessing and leveraging the, the laboratory insights into um, exploiting these 
relevant pathways, maybe either alone or in combination with ruxolitinib or other JAK inhibitors, that will clearly you know, improve our outcomes and our options for our patients. So you know, with that, I'm, I'm really uh, excited to, to look forward to the future for treating patients. I want to thank uh, Aaron, Dr. Gerds from Cleveland Clinic to, to join me. We, we do a lot of these programs together. And I always enjoy doing them with Aaron. Uh, I hope the audience found this activity informative and useful for your clinical practice. Uh, and we, we thank you for joining us today. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash SDA 860. This activity is supported through an educational grant from Bristol-Myers Squibb.